And today we arrive at uh, ch uh, chapter 3, verse 22 through 25. I title this message, Who is the Boss? Or maybe put in other words, Who do you work for? If I asked you right now uh, that question, what would you answer? Uh, as I was preparing for this, I came across a very interesting article. It comes from a commentary. And it describes what we have here now in verse 22. Please listen to it. It says, he had a menial dead-end job. They assigned him tasks that no one else wanted. The dumb work, the dirty work, the dangerous work. They called him out at all hours of the day and night to satisfy the whims of his supervisors. He had, no t uh, little, he had little hope for advancement. In fact, he'd be lucky just to keep his job. Plenty of others stood in line, ready to replace him. Whether he even lived or died mattered little. He was a first century Roman slave. Yet, he mattered to God. And his work mattered too. We have, uh, we'll be reading now chapter 3. Let's read verses 22 through 25. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as man pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve, notice here, who do you work for? Very clear. For you serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth a wrong shall receive for the wrong which he had done, and there is no except, uh, respect of persons. But it doesn't stop there. It goes on to chapter 4. Let's read verse 1. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that, you're, that ye also have a master in heaven. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to a very interesting passage. Complex to understand, especially in our day, 21st century. We know very little of slavery. I don't think any of one here has experienced slavery, at least not to this level that we find here. So, Lord, what you so what you're asking us to do here, Father, is a it's a little confusing. I think there is principles that we can extract from this passage that we can apply at the workplace. Actually, wherever we are, we need, Lord, to exercise what it says here, that you are the Lord. You are Lord. And if we get the full context all the way back to chapter 1, where you say that he is preeminent, and he did all things for himself. We get all these things together, we understand, Lord, that even the work that we do, the secular work that we do, whether we are supervisors, whether, whether we are just a normal workers down the chain, we need to understand that you are the boss. And that whatever you do, we need to do it for you, for, you, for your glory. And so, Lord, I pray this afternoon that you will help us get to understand this section, this part. And better than just understanding it, be able to live it out. For me, it's easy to stand up here and preach from this, uh, this these verses. But when we walk out of the church and have to put these things into practice, we find that it's much harder than it sounds. But not impossible. You would never command us to do something that is impossible to obey. But it's important for us, Lord, to understand our, the role that we play in this world. We are not from this world, but we need to live in this world, and we need to be different from this world. We need to be a light. And as we saw before, not just in our homes, but also in our workplace, in the marketplace, wherever we are, we need to show Christ. 
pray, Lord, that you help us, Lord, to, <clears throat> again, to understand and apply the principles that we will be extracted from this passage. Be with me, Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, when you think about work today, you say you, the, the, the worst job that you could get today would probably be 100% uh, better than the one that you would have uh, shown here with the servants and masters. In writing to this lowly worker here in chapter 3, verse 22 through 24, it seems like Paul redefines his occupational status. He was not just a Roman slave, he was an employee of the Lord Jesus Christ. And imagine the Lord just walked in here this afternoon and says, anybody want a job? Anybody want to work for me? And you might say, well, yeah, everything's going to be wonderful. He says, yeah, but you know, you're going to work for me over there and over there. And wherever you happen to land, that's where you will be working for me. <clears throat> now, th this, this, as, you, as you get to explore this, you, you, you'll understand that we need to make a difference wherever we are, even in the workplace. So, um, whether you are working in a giant multinational corporation or a mom and pop pizza parlor, you may have you may have 15 levels of bureaucracy over you, or be self-employed, it doesn't matter. Ultimately, Christ is our boss. I'm not going to move on until you say amen. amen. Thank you very much. So consider this. Christ gives you work to do. This morning when I preached uh, from this section, I asked people, do you, be, do you believe that only some Christians are called to be 100% uh, in ministry, and I was, and the and the room was full, and I was very glad that nobody raised their hand when I said only part of them are in full time ministry. When I said all of us are in full time ministry, everybody raised their hand. I was very pleased to see that, because where when when I got saved and I I met several missionaries, some of them would say, you know. Just the pastors and missionaries are full-time workers. The rest are just part-time workers. And that to me sounded like you could be a part-time Christian. It doesn't work. Whether you're a pastor, whether you're just a, you know, a layman, whether you're a person out there working, we are all called to be Christian wherever we are and to be Christian-like, which means that Christ needs to be in front of everything that we do. So we need to ask ourselves some questions this afternoon. Do you follow instructions well? You might have a very difficult boss who just, you know, they tend to get the worst out of you. How easy for you is it to follow the instructions they give you? Do you shirk our, uh, our, this word I, I don't use very often. This is really a, a word that I got from a somewhere else, do you shirk or uh, <clears throat> in your job when you are, when the boss is not around, do you, do you just kind of hide in the corner uh, for hours because the boss simply went home? Are you more interested in impressing them to gain approval or advancement than in getting the job done? How would you work? How would your work ethic change if Christ saw you, uh, how you served your supervisor? These are very, very important questions, which makes you know. If we understand what we see here, it means that our workplace is a very important place where we can do ministry, wherever we are. You might just be a man sweeping the streets. You might be a lawyer in a, in a high corporation. Whatever we are doing. It is, um, it can, we can turn it into a ministry. You know, for many years while I was working in the U.S. military base as a, as a civilian, in 19 years it came, uh, I had to work for about nine different bosses. 
because the military moves so often every two to four years, I would have a, bo a new boss every once in a while. And I had some very good bosses, which was very pleasant to work for, and others who believed that they could go into the office, serve, uh, uh, serve a cup of coffee, then lay the coffee down and go to the gym and spend the rest of the day there after giving instructions to the people that worked for him. Very difficult people to work for. But as I saw the scriptures, I thought, you know, whether he's in the office or not, he's not my boss. Or he thinks he's my boss, but my real boss is the Lord Jesus Christ. So when the other guys at, at the office, you know, just, just kind of quit, spend, instead of taking 15-minute breaks, they would take two-hour breaks and do the very least uh, during the eight-hour work, eight uh, uh, work time that we had, I was supposed to be there doing my very best, and this was not easy to do. You know what the, the Apostle Paul is doing here? He's turning the workplace into a mission field. Have you ever thought of your job as a mission field? What, you know, you have to get up in the morning and say, well, I don't really want to go to work, but I'm not going to see it as a job. I'm going to look at, look at it as a place where I can influence people with the salvation that Christ has given me with the Lord that I serve. The workplace in the mission field. That's an interesting concept. The word here, servant, dolos, or slaves, were very frequent in the first century. And if you look into history, you'll probably find that his, historians say that they estimate that between 10 to 20% of the first century Roman population were slaves. And uh, this slavery was not based on race. In fact, if you look at the pvs.org, the public broadcasting services website, it says this, slaves in, Roman, in Rome might include prisoners of war, sailors captured and sold by pirates, or slaves brought outside <coughs> Uh, Roman territory, in hard times, it was not uncommon for desperate Roman citizens to raise money by selling their children into slavery. All slaves and their families were the property of the owners who could sell and rent them out any time. Their lives were harsh. Slaves were often whipped, branded, or cruelly m mistreated. The owners could also kill them for any reason and would face no punishment. Now that's interesting. If you went to work in this kind, in this kind of environment, you, would be, you probably wouldn't, wouldn't want to leave home. They had no freedom at all. Now, a few were able to earn freedom, but most had, did not have that possibilities. These slaves had no motivation to do their best, and then uh, only, you know, they did only to face <clears throat> judge or punishment. So interestingly, uh, the Apostle Paul in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, James in James 1.1, 1, 1, Peter in 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Jude in, in chapter 1 verse 1, and John in Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, each called himself a dolos. Brother Tim, what does dolos mean? You've used that word lately very much. Paul was a dolos before he was an apostolos which means that he was a bond slave to Jesus Christ. So <clears throat> what we will be looking into here is ex how, what exactly is the Apostle Paul telling us to do and how can we apply this in, the 20, in, a, in a 21st century setting. Now as I was looking at this and preparing for this message, I, all of a sudden Joseph, the patriarch, the Old Testament uh, uh, character, uh, came to mind. I, pre I preached a message years ago, that, a title, From the Pit to the Palace. If you think of Joseph, he was sold uh, unfairly as a, as a slave at the age of 17 years old. And uh, he, was so, he was taken to Egypt, as you well know, only to be put in a, in a very low position, serving a man called Potiphar. But the thing we, we see with Joseph is that he served with the best spirit and the best, um, uh, and with his best uh, attitude that he could. He gave his very best. 
And although others might think, uh, why is he doing this? He's a slave. What motivation does he have to get up in the morning and to get up cheerful and be ready to do all this when he's not going to get any pay at the end of the month? What motivation? I wonder what motivated uh, uh, Joseph, but I think I have the answer. God was with him six times, I think five times in the Old Testament, one or two more times in the New Testament, and that, in, that means that he was completely sold out to the Lord. Whatever his situation was, I think he was the kind of man who had the, the different spirit, different from everybody else. So whether you put in whatever position you would put him, he would thrive. He moved from just a you know, farm job to become the uh, superintendent or the, the, the manager of Potiphar's estate. And did his very best only to be put in jail for a crime that he did not commit. Now, that's a reward. Is it worth living this way for the Lord? I mean, look at the reward you're getting. You try to do the best for year after year in the very worst conditions. And you end up in jail. So now, Joseph, what are you doing in jail? Well... I'm not going to do anything. It's not worth it. No, he gave once again his very best in the worst conditions to the point that the scriptures say that the jailer, the one in charge, gave him the keys and he just went for a nap. Now, if I had that opportunity, I'd probably run away. The one in charge is sleeping. I got the keys. I'm moving out. Well, not Joseph. He still gave his very best in service. But out of what motivation, what motivated him to get to do this kind of level of work? Was he expecting a paycheck at the end of the month? Was he expecting any kind of earthly reward? I wonder. But what you do see in him is always this incredible attitude, this incredible spirit, ready to help others. You know, probably nobody was paying attention, but there was one in heaven that was paying attention, and surely he rewarded Joseph. You know the end of the story. In a split second, somebody has a dream, the, the, the pharaoh. Nobody can interpret the dream. God is orchestrating something important there. And eventually, one of the men, probably two years before, who met Joseph, now remembers Joseph and says, I know something, somebody who can give us an interpretation of what you dreamt last night. And in, a, you know, in, in, in just a few hours, he's in front of the pharaoh, and this individual shows superiority in his character in just about every way. To the, and the way he brings out a solution to the problem makes the pharaoh understand that this young man is special. And he describes that he is one where the spirit of God dwells, one who... Uh, who was superior in spirit. And then he was placed as uh, the second most powerful man in the world in that time. When we see Joseph, we can see, and, and you see his example, you can go into this passage and say, is, is it worth it to live this way? Now, of course, we don't have slavery today, at least not in this part of the world, but we do have jobs that we don't like to do. <clears throat> For example, if you're a teenager, mama tells you, go and clean your room, go and la uh, 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 mow, the, mow the lawn, uh, do this, and you know, all those, if you were like me, a farm boy, mama would tell you, go and get the eggs from the chicken coop and clean the coop. You know what that means? You're going to be scraping poop all day. That's a fun job to do. I don't want to go into detail. <laughs> Mom tells you to do this, and you don't like it, but if you follow the instruction and the principles here, you're going to do it like, and say, Mom, I'm going to do it for the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm going to have the cleanest room that you'll ever see in, the, in your life. If it's a housewife, then maybe you have to uh, clean the house, or, uh, do the laundry, and many other very unpleasant... Uh, that's very pleasant for the ladies, right? You, you love to do the laundry. You love to clean the house. You love, you, this is something that you just get up in the morning and say, you know, this, I was waiting for this all week. Now, you get to do all these things, and you wonder, 
again, and next week, and the following week, and the following week. Melissa says, honey, I say, honey, what are you doing? She says, I'm, I'm being stupid. I said, what do you mean? She says, I'm doing the same thing I do every single day. And then she puts a smile. She's kidding around, but sometimes it's not kidding. And you wonder what keeps people, especially Christians, doing all these very unpleasant jobs and doing it with a cheerful smile and a pleasant attitude. I think the answer is right here. I think they have placed Jesus Christ as their Lord in everything. God wants us to do our very best. And now, as we get into this passage, I'm going to try to answer uh, these verses, verses 20, uh, 22, and then verses 23 through 25 with three questions. For example, the question will be, what, how, and why? Twice, I'll be using these three questions, what to do, how to do it, and why should we do it? And this will come out directly from verses 22, and then later on from verses 23 through 25. For example, the first point I'm going to be covering, I'll, I'll try to unpack that later on, is um, what are we to do? Look at verse 22. It says, obey. And here God commands us to obey our masters. And he tells us to do it to glorify him. And then the how, not with our eye service, but in singleness of heart. Not simply obey with eye service, just to please the one in, in front of you. Not as man pleases, as Paul presents it here. But seeking to glorify the Lord. Not as man pleasers, but with singleness of heart. So we have the why, the how, and then why should we do this? Because of the fear that we have, or the reverent fear that we have for the Lord. Then when we get to verses 23 through 25, we have the same three questions. What, what is the command? Do, and he has that word twice. Both words, by the way, in the Greek are different. And we'll see what that represents. Uh, what, are, what is he commanding to do? He says, whatever you do, do it heartily. And then he says, who to do it for, as unto the Lord, to glorify him. So what is the command? Do it, and then how? Heartily as unto the Lord, and not unto men. And then the third question, why? The Lord will reward you accordingly, verses 24 and 25. So let's unpack this a little bit. So maybe we can get some information, something here that will help us want to get up in the morning tomorrow, Monday. For how many of you, Mondays is a dreadful day? You, I mean, if you work from, from Monday to Saturday now, it used to be from Monday to Friday, but if you work from Monday to Saturday, whew, you got Saturday afternoon and maybe Sunday free, and then comes Monday again. You get the Monday blues. How many of you felt that way? Oh, no, I have to go back to work again. <laughs> to face that guy that just I can't even tolerate, and then those uh, uh, fellow workers there are so difficult to live with. Oh, I, I really want to stay in bed. But see, God says, get up. You have a mission to accomplish. So first we see the what. What do we do? It says obey. God here commands us to obey our masters. Now the application here, it, it does not matter whether one is in authority. Applied to today would be the mom, the dad, the husband, the boss. The government, we are to be, obey God in this. And when we obey, we listen to instructions, right? When we obey, we want to make sure that we do things according to what we've been asked. We need to pay attention. We have to do as we are told. You know, working for the U.S. Uh, government, for the U.S. military, is a very interesting learning experience because in the military you everything that you do has to be done according to regulation every single office no matter where you go in the base there's probably 3,000 soldiers there another 3,000 civilians we all have to do things according to the instructions every office must have the volumes of how things must be done and if you come from a spanish-speaking environment and you're told to do something you say aha uh -huh, yeah well I'll, then you do it your way and then you, when that things are done wrong, you answer, well, we've always done it this way, right? Is that how you do it in England? But how about Scotland and Wales? In Spain, this was the answer. But, but, 
this is how we've always done it. And my boss would say, not here. Things here are done according to the instruction book. And here's, you open up the instruction book and it says, you need to read this three times until you get it. And everything that you're not doing according to the book, you need to correct. Because in two, every two years, you're going to have an inspection. In our case, the, uh, uh, brothers and sisters, we have the Lord who will be inspecting. And when the inspection came, we would have a reward. We would have an, an excellent, we all wanted an excellent report. When we got less than that, our boss would say, we have a lot of things to change in the office. This next year will be going through all the things that have been reported we are doing wrong. And so we had to start tearing things down. Only to, for the, you know, just to be ready for the next inspection that would take place in two years. This, this was a learning experience for me. Because, you know, I like to do things my way. How many of you are there? We all want to do things our way, don't we? Because our way is the best way. Which means that if you're not doing things the way I'm doing it, you're wrong, right? This is the kind of attitude we have. And sometimes we use that same attitude in the church. But we've always done it this way. And the Lord says, well, how about getting into the word and making sure that you are doing things according to my way, because I need to be, you need to place me in a, a preeminent position, not just in an important position. This is important because we have the instruction book, the ultimate instruction book, the Bible. So what are we to do, Lord? Easy, obey. In these conditions, absolutely. Because I, you're really working for me. If you're looking for a reward, don't just be looking for the paycheck at the end of the month. Be looking for something even greater. You're working for me. Do it wholeheartedly as unto the Lord. Wholeheartedly? Come on, Lord, be real. In these work conditions, do you see my paycheck? Uh, not much to, for, to look forward to at the end of the month. I can't hardly, li hardly live on this paycheck. Well, imagine being a slave. You're not going to get a paycheck. And at the end of the month, all you're going to get, not even a thank you, you've done well. If you got that, you were doing good. You had authority over you. I worked for the American military 19 years. I started off as a, um, what they call a telephone exchange operator. We, we worked in a bunker underground. It was, uh, uh, you know, if the enemy comes, they go for communications first. And so we had to be highly protected. And I was working there in a very old, almost uh, last century ex uh, telephone exchange, the one you would get the cable and plug here and there. That's what I worked in. Later on, a few years later, I was uh, um, promoted <clears throat> to switchboard supervisor. Now I was in charge. And you know what I had to make sure that uh, the operators did? They had to work according to the book. And if we made any, everything that happened in the, uh, during those eight, year, uh, eight hours had to be reported. We had to make a log. Every single thing. Every five minutes, you need to make a log. At the end of the day, we would have to re, uh, turn in that log. If, and if, if things did not coincide with reality, we were in trouble. This showed me to be very, very diligent in the way I did things. Because I was going to be examined. Later on, I changed squadron and, and I worked for the... Uh, United States uh, Air Force uh, radio and TV station. And I worked as a, a, super, a logistics superintendent. Later, I was promoted to resource advisor. But nothing changed because we still had those manuals we had to follow. And every two years, we had an inspection. There was a lot of uh, tension, especially a few months before the inspectors would come because we knew that we would not be able to say, well, this is, we do it this way. We've always done it this way. You know what that would mean? It would mean a failure in our report. You say, what are you going, where are you going with this? It means that when we do things for the Lord, we need to understand not only what we are to do, but how we are to do it wholeheartedly with all your heart. So ladies, next week when you do your cleaning, 
You're going to be dancing around with your vacuum cleaner and be smiling when your husband tells you, Honey, are you enjoying this? I sure am. I'm doing it for my Lord Jesus Christ. I am thrilled to be serving the Lord as I clean the dishes. Amen, ladies? You don't get any amens for that. And for the men, when we are to do our work, if we follow the instructions, it's not only when I, this. And let me let me stop. Let me slow down a little bit. When Marissa's not watching, and I have to do the, and I have to do the vacuum cleaning. You know how fast I do it in five minutes. When she's watching, did you do it over there? Did you do it under the couch? So a message like this would make Marisa very happy. She wouldn't have to tell me to do things so diligently, so thoroughly, because it wouldn't be done for the eye service. You see what I mean? You can have the most meaningless job, but if you're doing it for the Lord, the Lord says, well done, my, my boy. So here's the text. We are to be different. Here's the, the lesson. We have to be different in our workplace, in the working environment. Their servants had no rights, no privilege, and ma- privileges, and many Christians were placed in the bind. And so they would come and say, but Paul, how would you serve? And, they, and Paul would say, servants obey in all things your earthly masters, not with eye service, Oof. as man pleases, but in singleness of heart. Ooh, that stings. Fearing God. Ooh, all these things were like, oh no, we are in trouble. <clears throat> Wholeheartedly, he says, for the Lord. You're going to get up tomorrow morning expecting no salary, no thank you, no, not, not a well done comment. You're going to do it and you're going to be happy about it. And at the end of the day, you're going to say, Lord, were you glorified in the way I did this? This changes everything, doesn't it? And he said, but Lord, what am I going to get out of it? Don't you worry about that. Trust me, I will reward you if you've done well. But if you haven't done well, then you're going to sow what you, uh, you reap what you sowed. So wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we need to have this in mind. We have the what to do. Notice Notice now the how. Not with eye service, but in singleness of heart. We must not simply obey with our service, not because they're watching, not as man pleasers, he says. Our service is work done only when being watched or just to look good on the outside. For example, if you're a student, no students here this afternoon, but if you're a student, you would say, um, Mama's not watching, so I'm not going to study. No, if you're a student, you would say, I'm going to study hard, and I'm going to study not just for the grade, I'm going to study as if the Lord Jesus Christ was my teacher. I'm going to do it for him. I'm not just going to look busy. I'm going to do it for, the, for God to be uh, glorified. I'm not just going to be busy but, you know, and do the minimum. I'm, I'm going to do the maximum I can. And when mom leaves... What do I do? I continue doing the best I can because the Lord is the one watching. I don't know about you, but this makes me a little, a little nervous. You know why? Because I see myself not doing this many times. I told the folks this morning, I said, you know, preaching from this passage is easy. I can get up here and tell you, this is how it's done. But then I have to go and leave the church and do it. And that makes, it makes all the difference. He says, not with eye service, not to please others, not just for them to give you a pat in the back and say, well done, but he says, with singleness of heart. The idea here is to work with sincerity, to have no ulterior motives. And this includes working to try to earn a favor or gain someone's praise. So you have the how. What about the why? Why should we do this? What's the motivation? Now, I think motivation is important. Going back to my kids, if I told them, boys, you need to clean your room. Most of the time, if they're like 13, 14, they're like, uh-huh, and then they do whatever they want. But if I had a 50-year-old bill in my hand and I said, go and clean your room, and you'll get this at the end if I see that you've done well, 
all of a sudden they had this urge to clean the room the best possible way. And it was because they loved daddy. <laughs> no, they loved the 50 year old Bill. So the motivation is important. You don't just want change, you want proper change, change that comes that change, you know, from, the, from interior change. Notice the why here. It shows that we fear God. Fearing God, it says there in verse 22, it has to do with reverential fear, not being scared of God, but saying, Lord, I, I, I revere you, I, I, I love you, I, I cherish you, and because I have this attitude towards you, I want to give you my very best. It could include fear, because we know that he's a mighty God, and we cannot hide away from him. But I think this is more a reverential fear. It is because we understand the position that he holds. So we have what to do, how we have to do it, and why. And the motivation here is because fearing God, verse 22. But it doesn't stop there. In verses 23 through 25, it says, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily, heartily as to the Lord, and, and not unto men, knowing, pay attention, that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive the wrong which he had done, and there is no exception of, of persons. So we go again with the question, what are we to do? And he, there's two do's there. Notice that in verse 23, he says, and whatsoever you do, comma, do. It so happens that in the Greek, you have two words for these two do's. One is poeido, poe, poeido, poeido. Brother Tim, help me here. According to Strong's, it means make or to fulfill, to keep, to hold, to band together, to commit, to do something. And then the other do is argo somai. Am I pronouncing that correct? It is a different word. And it means to toil, to labor, to, and, and, and it's commonly translated work. It's going to be hard work. And, this, and the command is, it, it is also it involves a command. So God is commanding us to work. And notice how God clarifies this a bit more. He said that whatever we do, that is make, produce, construct, prepare, form, etc. No matter what it is, we are to really work at it. If you're not doing it well now, keep working to make it better. Do you, you, you strive uh, to, for excellence. To, if you're doing something, uh, hopefully maybe next time you do it, you do it much better. Or is it just, well, uh, then nobody's going to notice. Do your best. This is what he's saying. Whatever you do, do your best. Keep trying your best to do it. And let the Lord be your motivation because this is something you're offering the Lord in service. And now we have the how. Notice what he says in verse 23. Heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. That word heartily is interesting. The word used here literally means out of the soul. <clears throat> now, if you compare this with other passages of Scripture, you find Something interesting, it, it's not just the soul involved here. In, Matthew, in Mark chapter 12, 30, it says, And thou shalt love the Lord with all thine heart, and with all thine soul, and with all thine mind, and with all thine strength. There's a lot of alls there. <laughs> this is the first commandment. Wow. It, you see that this goes all the way back to the beginning. It's because of the relationship, the vital relationship we have with the Lord. It's not just, just wing it. You know, it, I don't know if you use that word much, but while, we were, while I was working in the base, a lot of the American soldiers would use it. Uh, how do you fix this? Oh, I don't know. Uh, just wing it. And I said, what does wing it mean? Just kind of kick it, you know, do it, just whatever it is. Just, just wing it. Just give it a try, you know, and see what happens. Just wing it. Now, with the Lord, it doesn't work that way. You're not just going to make it work. You're going to make it work so that He is glorified. See, the, He is the object. 
We do all, he says, as unto the Lord. How many of you would say amen to that? Come on, give me an amen. amen. All right, that means that you're going to be cleaning toilets tomorrow. Amen? amen. No, you're not convinced of that. You just, you're giving me lip, lip service. Scrubbing the floor. Amen. I'm going to do it for the glory of the Lord. Doing dishes. No amens there. Typing a report. Teaching a lesson. Doing homework. Repairing a motor. Oh, I hate doing that. I can fix it. You give me a knife and I'll build you a house. But you give me a motor. I don't know what to do with it. Installing a program in the computer, Brother, brother uh, Steve. I know you love doing those things. You no problem with that. Painting a wall. Honey, why do you keep telling me I need to paint the house? Didn't I tell you six months ago that I would do it? Why do you keep repeating it to me? We don't love to do those things, do we? It's hard. Building a bench, preparing a, maybe a meeting, whatever it is that we have to do. We have to have, have this focus, not unto men, but unto the Lord. So the Holy Spirit had Paul add one last punch to the statement, and not unto men. <coughs> when we, now again, this is so simple for me to preach. You might be thinking, well, he's putting a lot of emphasis. That means he's practicing this in perfection. My brothers and sisters, let me tell you, this is cutting me as much as possibly is cutting you. This is a double-edged sword. And I, I read this and I said, Sammy, you have a lot of work to do. And most of the work that you need to do is first fix your heart. You have the right attitude. <clears throat> you know, sometimes, let me, let me show you how it works here. Uh, do, you, do you come to church and you see that everything's clean, everything's in place, everything is working, there's no leaks, um, seems like everything is in order? All oh, that just happens naturally. You don't have to do anything. Just come in. It's, you have a little uh, um, small men that do this. They're hiding somewhere out there. When you're gone, it's, you know, this is happening. It's automatic. You know, pastor doesn't have to worry about this. Things have been done all the time, and nobody ever notices them. And you might think, well, if nobody's going to notice them, I'm not going to do them anymore. Listen, if you don't do it for the glory of the Lord, you're going to be disappointed. People don't tend to notice those things. But it doesn't matter. Amen? It doesn't really matter. Because we're not doing it for men. Because if we were doing it for men, they might not appreciate it. My wife cooks for me. She says, what would you like tomorrow? And I give her my best shot. I want this. Oh, she does this for me. I'm going to love her more. I love her more if she doesn't. But you know, she, she spends, what, an hour maybe, two hours? And I gulp it in in five minutes. And she looks at me and says, all that for five minutes of joy? And I tell her, no, honey, five minutes. You do all that because you love the Lord. And when I have to put my, uh, my efforts into doing things in the house, I, I, I kind of think the same way. All that work, and maybe tomorrow it'll be broken again? It's not worth it. Just leave it like it is. No, you get up and you try your best. <clears throat> this verse in 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, I don't think this is pointing to the judgment seat of Christ. This, I think the reward can be received here. But if we don't receive him here, you know, we can, we, we can sure, surely receive him in heaven. In, in, um, let me finish that verse. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, what, uh, whether it be good or bad. But here in another passage... In Matthew chapter 10, verse 42, notice what the Lord said to his disciples. And whatsoever shall ye give to drink unto one of these little ones, a cup of water, he says, uh, you know, uh, if you do this for me, he says, you'll be rewarded. A cup of water to a child, a cup of water to a brother or sister who needs help, needs uh, refreshment. Uh, 
you know, going beyond your call of duty. Let me put it in, 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 in biblical terms. The Lord said to his disciples, listen, if somebody asks you to do a mile, if you understand what that, where that goes, you'll understand that the Roman soldiers, because they had taken the land, had the right by law to ask anyone in that land and say, you take this, you know, carrying this, this, this heavy load, put it down, say, hey, you take that, and they were obligated to do a mile. If you're a Christian, you could say, uh, excuse me, do I have the privilege of doing two? This would blow the Romans' mind and say, what? I thought I was the boss. I thought I was commanding you. I thought I had the, uh, the, the, the power to tell you. To, and, and then the Christians would say, oh, no, there's somebody superior to you. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm doing two for him. These things were uh, amazing in, in, in the times in which they were written. And it should be also something that we can apply in our life. Let me try to finish with, with this. <clears throat> If you have a dirty job, a boring job, a smelly job, a job that nobody appreciates, an unpleasant job, or if it's a fun job, always remember, remind yourself that you need to do your very best and understand and, and then the motivation, not for reward, but because of my love for him and the glory I want to have for him, because I have reverential fear for him. How many of you have heard the name Franz Joseph Hayden? You have, right? There's an article about him that is titled, Franz Joseph Hayden Gives Glory to God. I thought, oh, that, that must be interesting. So I read it. First, I needed to get a bit more information of this man. Joseph Hayden lived in 1732 to 1809 in Vienna, Austrian composer who was one of the most important figures in the development of the classical style in music during the 18th century. He helped establish the forms and styles for the string quartet and the symphony. Well, this article says, Franz Joseph he Haydn gives glory to God. It says this, Franz Joseph Haydn was present in the Vienna Music Hall when his oratorio, The Creation, was being performed. Weakened by age, the great composer was confined to a wheelchair. As the majestic work moved along, the audience was caught up with tremendous emotion. When the passage, and there was light, was reached, the chorus and the orchestra burst forth in such power that the crowd could no longer retain its enthusiasm. They got up in the, and they started cheering away. The very assembly rose in a spontaneous applause. But Hayden struggled to stand up in motion for silence. He raised his hand and pointing into heaven, he said, no, no, not for me. But from thence, come on. Imagine the impact. People were saying, how great this man is. And he was saying, no, no, you don't get it. He, the Lord Jesus Christ, must receive all the glory. Hardly could get up, get up from his wheelchair. I think he understood. And as he said this, he fell back on his wheelchair, exhausted because of the effort he had to make. You know, this is, of course, a great uh, moment in the life of Hayden. But you might see yourself in the low moments where nobody is getting up and saying, well done. Still, you have somebody in heaven who says, if you did it for me, you will have a reward. Now, the passage doesn't finish there because we have chapter 4, verse 1, but basically the same principles there. There's a what, there's a how, and there's a why. And if we don't have the why in place, we will probably not give God our very best. Let's all stand and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we... Let me just put myself first. I, I confess, I don't always do my very best. And it's because 
I'm not having you in scope, not having you in focus. I might be tired. Maybe I don't understand that those lowly jobs that I have to do can actually glorify the Lord. But here in this passage, we find that whatever we do, whatever we do, even sleep or eat, if we do it for you, Lord, it'll be done well. May we learn from this passage, Lord. May we get up tomorrow and look at the responsibilities that we have to do, but look at them differently from a different perspective, from this perspective that we find here this afternoon. Help us change, Father. Help us uh, change our focus on how we live. May we understand that not, you're not just important. You're not just prominent. But you are preeminent and you did all things to glorify yourself. May we comply, Lord, with these commands that you give us here. May we die to self, as you say there in chapter 3, mortify the flesh. Put off these carnal um, vestures, these carnal uh, clothings that you have acquired during your life, these bad habits, these bad attitudes, these sinful actions. Put them off, he, he says, and then put on um, these new characteristics. They can be put on, Lord, if we are filled with the Holy Spirit. We want the, the character of the Holy Spirit to show in us. But sometimes we're just too full of ourselves. We're just too concerned of self. We put self on the altar instead of putting Christ. And it shows in the way we do things. May that change, Lord, now that we have gone deeper into this passage. That we understand that there's nothing too small for you. May we remember next time we have to do things that we don't like. The purpose. So that, Lord, we do it with excellence. Help me, Lord, and help my brothers and sisters be able to live out this command in our daily life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.